So I grew up in the mud, and dysfunction in family was standard, being from what we at that time called the hood, and being one of the youngsters in the hood at that time, uh, I was a menace to society. And at the very same time, I didn't want to be a menace to society, but my environment, my environment asked for me to be that, to survive in the environment that I was as an African-American male. I had to set a standard for violence, crime, uh, and anything else that was a rebel at the time. So, like all the other young men that I know either dead or they went to prison. When I started going to prison, I went at 12 years old. I was still in getting sent to juvenile receiving center. And I grew up with a mother and father that was from down south and they were stern and they get your education and, or you get a whooping. I always got my education, I was an A student. I snuck out the window at night though uh, to get in the streets and do what I needed to do. And by the time my mom and dad got up to go to work at four or five o'clock in the morning, get back to Waukegan, go back to construction, working down the line and those type of things, working as maids and my dad working uh, as a waiter, I would be back in the house and, and playing the sleep role. They'll check in and I act like I've been there all day, all night. But I had a nightlife that caused me as a young, young adult to pick up a gun. I was 15 years old, started carrying a gun when I was 13 years old took it to school, didn't get caught without it. So, as you, as you can imagine, I went to prison at 15 years old for armed robbery and murder. At 15 years old, and I did. Did I want to be accountable for it? No, I called it an environment consequence that I had to deal with because I came from that environment. It was either, and it almost happened, uh, get shot and die or shoot and live. As a matter of fact, I've been shot nine times all over my body throughout the, the course of my life and I had to find a way, find a way to survive through that. And going back and forth to prison taught me one thing, that if I didn't get it together, I was going to die in prison. So. If we fast forward, I had a child by this time, um, 35 years old. I started going when I was 12. By 35, I had a child. And I love to get here because this is the place where I always, always get moved to tears. As an African-American male who was a boy at 35, a little girl, 12 years old, walked into prison and asked her dad, how come you can't take care of me? And every time I think about that, every time I think about that, it touches my heart. I don't care how many times I speak, how many times I talk with her about it, that little girl had to tell the tree to grow up and be a tree so she could be a branch and grow the fruit from the tree that I thought was my legacy. So, when that little girl walked into prison and asked me that, all I could do was give her a pitiful, I'm sorry, daughter. I don't know why, but I knew why. Drugs, alcohol, vice, crime, street life had took control of me. And I had become a part of the streets instead of a part of my life. So at 35, at 35 years old, 
after many, many years of drug addiction, cocaine, heroin, you name it, I done it all, sold it all. But at 35, when she asked me that question, she empowered me to be the best version of myself. I went back in that jail cell, walked that yard, prayed, planned, and tried to find an understanding of what was going on. And the reality of what was going on, God revealed to me. He said, look, that's my child. You're my child. Until you find a way to take care of yourself, you can't take care of her. I got her. I needed to hear that because my focus would have been on her instead of on me. And once I found out that I needed to take care of me and be the best version of myself in all areas as a man, I could take dominion over my life and become the man that I needed to be and be empowered by her conversation so that she never ever had to ask her dad again, ever again, how come you can't take care of me? Me and that little girl have competed in education together. Uh, we have bought, I helped her buy things together, buy cars, buy houses. She got my grandkids. We became one, me and that little girl. But I had to become one with myself before I could even think about becoming one with her and extending myself to her. And a lot of times we have a hard time in empowerment because we forget to take care of ourselves. We try to take care of everybody else to make sure everybody else's needs are fed, filled, especially with children, those of you who got children. I don't watch parents render all of, their, all of their pouring into their child and forget to pour into themselves. So then when the child really needs them, they don't have it. They don't have the strength. They need to take care of the child on a genuine, I need to say no. Have anybody ever told you no and you felt empowered? You know you're only one yes away? Sometimes you need to hear no. How many times have you told your child no and felt comfortable with it? You need to get comfortable with that. Because the real world, they're going to hear no. So, now, when I get out of prison, after, after that little girl walked into the prison, right? Hear me. I was facing 40 years. Dead to right, they caught me burglarizing and picking up a gun in the act of a commission of a burglary with a repeater. I was ending up with 40 years, facing 40 years. I turned my life over. I said, God, I just need to go home. And whenever you send me home, this has never happened again. I had been in prison so many times that the prisoners and guards knew me, and they knew I was always a model prisoner, get there, get my education, study hard, do everything I needed to do, preparation paperwork and all of those kind of things. I knew how to put pop paper and what we call pop paper. I knew how to do all that. I had an opportunity to learn all that because I did so many incarceration, education. I sit here now with, in front of you with two master's degrees because Prison made it easy for me to do education because of the paperwork I knew to used to do in prison. So I came home and it was easy to get my education and, and do the master's degree. I always was a good student. But in, in that prison situation with 40 years, I didn't know when I was going home. I left it up to God. And most of you guys may not be spiritual uh, or religious to the level that I had to get to to find my way. God has never let me down. He has always, always been there. God. I was facing 40 years dead to right. I said, I, I surrender. The greater the sacrifice, the greater the reward. Mm -hmm. In 12 months, they were coming to release me and said that you can go home. I said, well, I got 40 years. They said, well, we ran, the, we ran four concurrent with another four, and you, you're already done four. We're going to let you go home. So, facing 40 years, doing, saying that prayer, I ended up only doing one year. I understood it as a blessing. I still understand this in front of you guys right now on this stage as a blessing. I shouldn't be here. I've been shot nine times. Top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Nine times. 
I had an over overdose on drugs and alcohol numerous times. Still here to empower. I'm one of the blessed ones who understand that God touched my life. And I acknowledge that in everything that I do, every single day I acknowledge that God gave me a second chance. I'm 65 years old. 65. I know at least 50 brothers that I used to run with that didn't make it past 30. They died. Drug overdose, in prison, come home, gunshots, whatever, whatever. They're dead. They don't get no second chance. I was fortunate enough to get a second chance. So now that I got a second chance, my empowering life is inspired by the people that I'm able to touch. Brandon Morris, you can be more. 262, Linda Faye Foundation. Derek uh, Booker, Line for Line. Kente Barnell, Barnell Sports and Education. Joe Wynn, Walking in My Shoes. Arlene Griffin, uh, God's Kitchen. And there's a lot of more people that was able to come to me to get inspiration on what it takes to open a business, what it takes to do this thing in Kenosha, which is very hard to do. But being empowering, like that little girl empowered me, I don't worry about what they take from my ideals. I pour it because that's what God gave it to me for. Will I like to be compensated? Sure. What if I ain't? I'm already compensated because I'm blessed. So when you start changing your life and you start empowering because it's your responsibility, when I say greater, greater the sacrifice, greater the reward, I mean this. I had to stop doing drugs. There's some young men in here today that's looking at me and saying, man, since you stopped doing drugs, I was able to know that it was possible to stop doing drugs. I see my alderman over there, Mr. Harper. We sat around and talked about being an alderman way before he became alderman. Look at him, he's an alderman. He got his power. Just from a conversation from a brother. Stand in, don't quit. Don't quit, you can't quit. Get your plan. After you pray and meditate on it, get your plan. Understand what your plan gonna be and stick to it until it comes to manifest itself right in front of you. You can't run from it. You wanna go and open a business? Guess what you gotta do? Go open a business. I guess, you wanna write a book? Guess what you gotta do? Go write a book. Quit talking about it, be about it. You wanna be a better dad? Be a better dad. Not for nobody else, but for you. You want to have things in life? You want wealth? Wealth is very easy to obtain. You know what it takes to get wealth? Investing in yourself. You scared to invest in yourself? You won't have no wealth. That means exercising. That means studying. That means doing things that other people just won't do. There's going to be some late nights that you're going to be up studying. You ain't going to be at the club. Right? That's what it takes to build wealth. And not just in finance, in your health. It's no good to have a whole bunch of money and you have bad health. You want to enjoy it. And guess who we benefit from us becoming the best version of ourselves and empowering ourselves? Our kids. We got people that truly, genuinely think that they've done everything they need to do for their kids, but they're getting drunk and getting high in front of your kids and thinking that your kids are not supposed to do it. If there is no sacrifice, there is no reward. Well, I'm grown. I should be able to do what I want to. No, you can't. Those are your seeds. They came from you. Jenna Graham. Whatever they've been birthed to, that's what they're going to do. You teaching it in your family, 
You do it in your house, they're going to do it outside your house. That's why so much is uh, contingent on us to make the sacrifices that we need to do to empower ourselves so that we can give an example to our children that can lead to hope and possibilities. Guess how long you got to do it? For the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful thing. The consistency that goes with living the life that you want to have. Focused, practical, concrete, consistent. Are you going to be consistent in learning how to open your business? I know a lot of people have started their business and they stop. Guess what? Just because you have to adjust doesn't mean that you're a failure. The lesson is I've been built for this. So if I have to adjust and sell property, then guess what? I wait till the next piece of property comes. It's not a failure because I didn't quit. When you quit, you lay hold to the failure. If I miss a if I miss a shot and we lose a game, and there's no time on the clock, guess what? I wait for the next time I'm in the game, and there's some time on the clock, and I try to hit because that opportunity is gonna come around again to be that which you are trying to be. If you don't quit, I had the worst couple basketball seasons of my life. I'm a high school basketball coach and also a professional basketball coach. My professional journey was I was a winning basketball coach, won championships at the professional level. My team made a hiatus because I coached too hard. The whole team left, so I had to get a new team. And that year we went 2-12. I'm used to going 12 and 0 at a pro level, right? My team left. They seen that I wasn't going to quit. Most of the players that left that was under contract came back. I didn't beg them back, but I was always smart enough to know I'm not going to question why you're back. Let's get going. My pride could have got in the way and said, oh, y'all left me in a... No, this is, about back. this is about what I'm trying to do. This is the intelligent part of getting caught, caught up in doing what I need to do, not being emotional, not losing myself emotionally. I said to myself, y'all back, let's get going. Let's, I will never have to mention it again. So we won two championships back to back. Currently, I'm a high school coach, and we have a losing season. In the, development, in the development stages of what we're trying to do and build in our program and in our culture, and you got to pay a price for that. Greater the sacrifice, the greater the reward. I can run because I'm used to winning, or I can stay and say I am a winner because that's what I am. That's what I am. That little girl made me understand to be empowered, to show her the example of what a winner do. A true leader, a true winner will stand in the controversy of stress, of stress and of struggle, of pain, long suffering. A loser will crumble, run, go to prison, do dope, be irresponsible. I choose not to do that. I choose to fight. To fight to give my daughter an opportunity to see that the possibilities of standing and fighting is far greater than running and losing. Don't run from abuse. Don't run from your path. All of those things are your mess, right? Everybody know what messes are, right? In life. Issues in life, right? Let me tell you something about messes and issues. Everybody who got a testimony has been through some mess. So your mess becomes your message. Thank you, Michelle. Your mess is your message. And unless you can go through something, you can't get through nothing. Guess what? Every single body that you know have experienced something, whether they hide it or they get up here and be able to share the testimony of hope and say, you know what? No matter what you go through, you can get through. And whatever you went through, has gave you the experience to get through. You've been built for this. 
You've been built for it. You've been built for a knock upside the head, a loss. So that you can appreciate when the wind comes. You will know in your story, when you start telling your story, you will know for a fact I've been abused. I'm a man, right? Black man. There's a lot of knocks against black men. A lot of knocks. Rightfully so, though. Rightfully so. That's why it's contingent on us as black men to take our rightful place and say, you know what? No more. I'm going to be the leader that I've been called to be. Or we have, we have this thing now in our culture, we talk about kings. Do you actually know what that means when you say that, king? And you got to understand what that responsibility means. Just on history, you're saying you're a king. Well, there's a, there's a, a lot of responsibility with being a king and having a queen in the house. Especially if you're talking about your lady as a queen. You're talking about running something properly that probably has some children that you call a part of your kingdom. So if you are king, you're providing, protecting, and taking care of that kingdom which you call your home. And that goes to any man. And sometimes we have allowed our queens to become our kings because of our irresponsibilities to be the kings that we need to be. Got to grow up and take that responsibility and be empowered by men who are showing you that you can love, but you must always love to be in love with yourself. I know a lot of people in relationship that love each other they love each other, but not in love with each other. God, you ever been in a relationship like that? You, you in love with this person, but he just loves you. He won't give you what you give him. Yeah. But you got to be in love with yourself enough to say, no matter how much you love me, I love me enough to take care of me first so that even if you don't love me, I can love you and don't, come, and don't need you to love me back. Ah, oh, that's an that's, uh, empowering situation that we got to get to that a lot of times we have fought, fell away because we've been taught, we've been taught as, a, as a people that we should take care of everybody, right? You've been taught. Provide. You're selfish if you take care of yourself. How is that possible? You're selfish. How is that possible? If I don't take care of me, who's going to take care of me? Right now, who take care of you when you wake up in the morning, wash your face, brush your teeth? You got somebody to do that for you? So if I don't love me enough to take care of me, I cannot give the example of what that looks like to a child. How will a child ever know if I can't demonstrate that for them? Well, that's why we have to empower each other and keep it real about who we are. Like I said, I've been, I've been in the mud. My story has been in the mud. I got, out of, I got out of that prison in 1994, and I made it my business to take care of me so that I could provide for my child the way a man is supposed to provide for my child. And she was mad as all outdoors at some point because I would take care of me first so that I could provide the real life to her that she needed. Did I want to buy her Jordans? Did I want to make sure that she was smiling every time and all of those kinds? Yeah, I wanted to do that. Yeah, I wanted to do that. But I decided greater the sacrifice, the greater the reward. Now she got four kids that she has to provide for. And she do it very well because she was taught well how to provide with the reasons that I taught her. Yeah, you got to buy your own first car. I'll help you, but you want to buy your own first car. Oh, Dad, you got you got two cars. You can let me help. No, buy your own. So you can appreciate having. It. Well, these people do. White people do this. Well, I'm not white, and I'm not doing that. 
<laughs> Tough stuff. But she a better child for it. She a better child for it. Because you have to teach within the confines of what you're able to do. And, and, and trust me, the, the next thing that you will ever have to do to be empowered, and please, please hear me on this and study it and find out for yourself. If you got anger about history, about society, let it go. Find a way to love in order to grow. Tough. The reality of history is tough. The background of history is tough. But love will always, always heal a multitude of sin, especially if you love yourself first. Okay, what happened? Bad refereeing, bad white society, white supremacy, it doesn't matter. Let it go. It is what it is. That past will not generate my future. I will take charge of my future and give what I need to give to myself so that I can make heals, I can heal people and produce the entrepreneurships and the, the winning that we can to do individually. If, a, if one man can stand up and five or six businesses can come out of just him changing, just imagine if 10 of us do that. The ins inspiration that we could give each other. That's what this is all about. My story is all about this. Will you be empowered enough to stop sleeping on your dreams? When you gonna write the book? When you gonna open a business? Why you keep thinking about it? Go! Stop! You know it is inside you. Why are you letting it just die? You gonna take it to the graveyard? What, what, what will you lose if you don't do it? Should be everything. You don't want to go to the graveyard without fulfilling the purpose in your life that you are being called to. Some of y'all been called. You've been called. You know you've been called. Why are you running? You can't run no more. My story is finna tell you that you have been enslaved long enough. You can be anything that you want to be today. You don't have to sleep on it no more. Your imagination is your springboard to whatever it is that you want. You have it inside you. You were born with it. Now bring it forth. You're a writer? How come you ain't wrote the story? Write the story. Somebody need to hear it. There's a little girl somewhere that need to know about abuse. She going through it right now. Now, we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, first, for to live, someone sent in questions in advance. They said, what are your plans after high school? My plans after high school, so I'm looking into EMT construction or motivational speaking. So as of right now, I'm trying to get exposed to all these different types of things out there, trying to get a feel for what I like and what I don't like, so that way I'm not taking this long process to get to what I want. So I've been getting exposed to EMT. I've been going around taking nursing classes at school. I uh, go to uh, the Gateway. They got some nice nursing classes. And then they also got construction programs. And I've been looking and I've been getting exposed. And with the help of Ms. Nicole and the Boys and Girls Club, I've been getting out there and I've been traveling with these HBCU colleges. Uh, they paid for me to go, so I was fantastic. I was glad to go. Yeah. And I was also looking into uh, colleges. I was looking into uh, Texas State University and Alabama State University and uh, Fox Valley Tech and Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, so for LaShonda now, what continued to inspire you with the hardships that you had in your upbringing? 
Um, I would have to say that I was inspired. It's, I was inspired by my children um, because I knew that if I didn't do the inner work to yes. heal myself, that I was going to pass along a lot of generational traumas. And so that's what um, motivated me and inspired me the most. All right, and then for Tony, you mentioned uh, seeing your daughter walk across the uh, the day room floor, okay? Uh, and she asked, "Why can't you take care of me?" What is the advice that you give to parents now when their children approach them in a similar fashion? Ask the question, uh, what would you like to see me do? And have that dialogue with your child. Uh, you and your child should have open dialogue about what would it take to be great to each other. Because a child has a responsibility in response, and an adult has a response in action to make sure the child is living in an environment that makes sense to both of them to grow and be connected in the family. Love is, love is always the greatest gift that you can give. Sometimes you just need to just hug and say, I love you. I, I, for me and my daughter now, that's all we do. We hug on each other. And every time we see each other or we part from each other, the one conversation you can always hear is, I love you, Dad. I love you, daughter. Regardless. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, before I ask any more questions, anybody else have a yeah. question right now? Yeah. Hey, my question is for you, Tony Moore. If any, can you just tell us a little, a little bit about the hardships that you did face with people taking you serious and believing you as you were getting ready to get rehabilitated back into society and become the man that we see in front of us? The hardest thing about other people's trust in you is that's not my business. I got to take care of my business based on what my plans say. I don't care whether you trust me or not. I got to do this because my legacy depends on me to do it. And it doesn't matter if anybody trusts in me or not. I know God trusts me and he gave me the plan to, to deal with it. Hardship I don't let my feelings get involved with what I'm trying to do with the community. I don't, I don't let that get happen. Because if you let your feelings get in the way, you're going you're gonna to respond angrily, and you're really going to have a hardship if you got my background. Then you're going to have people scared to work with you. And I have to be humble enough for my hardships to say, it don't matter what they think is what I do. I'm going to keep demonstrating through love, regardless of however anybody perceived me. I'm going to keep walking through love. I, I took life, so I, I got to give love. I can't afford to miss the game because I'm 65 years old. I'm closer to death than I am to having another life to live. So I got to be on point with my love and the love I display towards doing my work. I do human service, uh, mental health, and all that. And those, those are the things that you just got to deal with. Who created those hardships? I did. So for me to unjustly ask somebody else to give me anything that I don't deserve does me no, does me no anything. I got to do what I got to do anyway because my daughter and the legacy of my wife depends on it. It depends on it that I leave a legacy for my kids, man. It depends on it. So I don't care what you think. Is that, is, did I answer it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, anybody else? I'm Go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, this is from Mr. Young. It's not even a question. It's more of a challenge. All right, so you're not a student advocate no more. You're Mr. Young because mm -hmm. you're like a real advocate for people that actually went through traumas as a youth. All right, I'm a youth from 42nd, you know what I'm saying? From the Renaults, from Kenosha, from everywhere in this world. So at the same time, I want you to start focusing on solutions, not the issues, 
but the solutions. And not knowing that brief thing that you did, as far as spoken word, giving it rhythm to life, how much it was easy. And then you start reaching out to your elders, to Ms. Carr, to, you know what I'm saying, Mr. Tony Moore, and you actually grab their knowledge and then focus on solutions, not the problems. But then you start talking more and being more vocal because you're more empowering, because you're more relatable. You understand? That's, I mean, Ripperton, that's the temptations, but you're Marvin Gaye. You get what I mean? Yes, you're more relatable to the, to us as far as being able to tell us because we've been through that. We've been through her situation. We've been through his situation. But you're telling us that as a newer youth. So I want you to understand your empowerment is empowering us to be able to be more by speaking up and having the courage because the younger youth don't know that they, they have that value. And I appreciate you for speaking out. So I just wanted to acknowledge that it's not even a question. It's just a challenge for you to reach out to your elders and take the knowledge from your elders and then spread it to the youth. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. This is great. Uh, a little quicker than me. But I got a question for <laughs> I got a question for for each of you. If you now that you've um, conquered those great challenges in your life, what could what kind of advice would you have for your younger self now that you've um, overcome such big obstacles? my younger self. Um, I know it sounds cliche, but it gets greater later because I really didn't have a whole lot of hope when I was younger. I didn't really have a lot of people that I could turn to, that I could really let them know what I was experiencing. And um, yeah, I would tell myself that it gets greater later the more you push through. Um, of course, keeping God first because that's really the huge, um, the huge thing that got me through a lot of what I've experienced. So I would say it gets greater later. And just to keep pushing through because, you know, if you give up, like Mr. Moore said, you won't know what the future holds. If you give in, you know, then that's where you lose. So, uh, I would like to say the word uh, persistent. I was recently studying uh, some words so I can, you know, fulfill my vocabulary so that way. I go around, I can speak highly and know what I'm talking about. And the most recent word I came across was persistent. What persistent mean is staying consistent while going through hardships. I mean, anybody can be consistent. But once you stay persistent in that moment and keep your head up, you're going to realize that life does get better. Thank you. That's a good question. For a 65 year old man, that's a real good question. What I have learned is this God ain't finished with me yet. That's what I would tell my younger self so that I'll know that through all those heartbreaks and all those hardships that I went through, jail, prison, shot, overdose, God wasn't finished with me yet. Because now I sit here and I'm still saying, I got more work to do. God ain't finished with me yet. So keep being persistent. Keep in the game and don't quit. Don't quit. My old, my older self, I quit a lot and went back door. I know now. Keep going. Keep going. Thank you. Um, 
So, and this could be for all of you guys who go and start with you, Tony, and then uh, finish up. Um, mm -hmm. What is your proudest moment thus far? My proudest moment is my daughter. Uh, my daughters and sons and a godson. The, the people that God has put me in charge of as an adult male to watch y'all grow and become the people that y'all are. God brought me back so that I get a second chance. I got the second chance. I'm good now. I'm good. I'm good. My kids are on the right track. Everybody that, I, that God has put me in charge of as a man is doing well. I'm good. They're good parents. They, they got kids. I, I'm so happy about that that I, I got the second chance to get back to do that because I wasn't supposed to have a second chance. I was supposed to die. I wasn't supposed to be here. But to watch my kids grow and be, become men and women, I'm good. If I'm gonna live another day after we, this is over with, I'm good. Ashana. Um, I have two examples. So uh, the first one would be healing parental and child relationships with my kids. And the reason why I say that is because that doesn't really exist in my family. Mm. And so it's been um, eye-opening for me and I'm very proud of the work that I'm doing to be a better parent to both of my children. I didn't really focus on that until I was in my 30s and I'm in my 40s now. And um, I'm really proud of that because it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, I've had some significant struggles with my youngest child and um, even my firstborn child and to be doing it independently, <laughs> to be doing it independently and um, just really making the changes that I just never really saw in my family and to continue to educate myself, to continue to acknowledge when I'm, you know, wrong as a parent for the sake of building healthy relationships with my kids, I'm really proud of that. And then the second one is I opened a business in Kenosha a couple of years ago and I ran that business for four years and I was just so dead set on making my mark in the community. And I believe that I did that with the help of God, even though it wasn't my intent. I ended up operating a business that God just really placed in my lap. And throughout the time that I ran that business, I was able to come across a ton of women who had very similar situations with mine. And I was in the, the thick of it with my son and really wanted to just close my business and give up. And seeing that I was able to inspire and empower all those women while still being in the thick of things with my own son, that really made me realize that that was my purpose. And so that's how I ended up becoming a life coach for women who have the same or similar situations as mine. And so I was really proud of myself for being able to endure my own struggles while still empowering and inspiring other women without giving up. So. The proudest moment. Yeah. I also too have two proudest moments. My first proudest moment is when I realized how powerful my voice was. Mm. Because I realized that I can use that. And I love being social, I love smiling, and I love getting out there, I love being active, and I can just put those little certain words into those minds that really need them, and give them that little inspiration, that little guide, that little push, just being there for them, and having that right sense of tone, having that, that connection, and building that bond, because once you build those bonds, some of those bonds are unbreakable. And my second is when I hugged my mom and I felt mm. a relief. Because mm. my mom went through something. I went through something. We all went through something. And just by holding her, and letting her know, and letting my siblings know, know I got them. Man. Mm. 
I want to break that cycle. I know they're looking up to me, and I want them to keep looking up to me because I know I'm going to do right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Got time for a couple more questions. If I before I throw out any, anybody else have some questions? No. Uh, have a question. Okay. Uh, I want to know who came late. <laughs> okay. Um, if I like to give a comment and a question. So the comment is something from my grandmother. She would always say, you have to learn to hug yourself. Learn to hug yourself. So you have to go back to the drawing board, even when other people don't love you, get in the mirror and hug yourself. Start all over again. You didn't give the best prayer. You don't even know why your raggedy butt is here. But you're here. Learn to hug yourself. Start all over. You're right as you go. Just keep trying. So that's my comment. Second, uh, the question is for all three. Since we're all right in our story, and we should take time, and I think you spoke about healing. So we're healed and we're healing daily. So since our story is being written, who or what would you like to add to your life right now? As we're, we're all writing our story as we speak. We're not the same as we was yesterday. So we're writing our story. But who or what would you like to add to your life? That's for all three of y'all. I'm going to get away from the mic, too. <laughs> to live well, let you take a shot at that first. Wow. Great question. I would like to say my grandfather. I never really met him in person, but he sent me a letter every single one of my birthdays until I was 12 years old. He called me on a daily just to check up. <laughs> he called me and FaceTimed me while I was in the hospital for six months. He, he wanted to take me fishing. He always gave me those little words of encouragement that stuck with me, and I'm sharing it all now. I want to show him that those words stuck with me, and the little things that he did matters to me. Thank you. Shonda, are you okay? okay. Tony? Yeah, for me, that's a serious, serious question. I'm an author. Uh, I wrote eight books. And the one thing that I want out of life is to empower and give an inheritance to my children of love, understanding, and possibility of hope to be empowered to find God for themselves. If I could write that and know that that story was fulfilled in my next book, my heart would be blessed. I want all my children to find God like I had to find God for myself. And if, that, if I can do that, that inheritance would blow my mind. Um, I would have to say my siblings. I have three older siblings and I have a younger sibling and we are not close at all. Um, there's age gap, there's life circumstances that have caused us to be separated. And so if I could change or add, I would like them to be closer in location and in relationship because we're all scattered all over the place right now except for my younger sibling. And I just would really want to encourage them and inspire them with the things that I've learned about how to heal family relationships and um, just encourage and inspire them to know that they can do the same and that in turn we can help one another and then we can continue to help our children. Mm, thank you. Thank you for that. 
All right, so one last question just to close us out. Um, any final thoughts about tonight that you want to share with them? And Talib, we'll start with you. Lashana, they will let Tony close it out. But any final thoughts or quotes or any last words that you have for us tonight? That phrase, you embody hope and encourage others to do the same. Mm -hmm. That phrase stuck with me for a long time. It's because it let me know hope was still out there. And when I want to pass that along to everybody, hope is still out there. And smile. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with smiling, you know? Yes, and smiling can make someone's day just by bringing that joy. You can bring somebody's inspiration up. Thank you. Thank you to Lily for those final thoughts. Shonda, final thoughts after tonight. Um, my final thought would go back to the message that I shared earlier in that um, if you are somebody who is not really sure of your identity as you focus so much on whatever title you have, whether it be mother, sister, um, therapist, wife, whatever have you, I encourage you to seek God to get your identity from Him. Because once you become grounded in that, you'll become so unshakable and unmovable that you'll be able to accomplish anything. Thank you for that. And Tony, last and final thoughts. Empowerment and love. If you continue to push yourself to be empowered by love, it's going to bless this world. Just continue to understand that I can help somebody in spite of what they are and who they are and continue to help. I deal, with, I deal with all kinds of clients because I'm a therapist, mental health and substance abuse from all different areas in life. I have to love people in spite of what they come to me with. It is the greatest joy that I ever get, man, is that I can love somebody who other folks just throw away. Criminals, sex offenders, all, all of the above. Love is the only thing I ever found in therapy to help heal somebody in its totality. So empowering and love in spite of. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. In, in closing, oh, Francisco, can I get another water, please? In closing, we're going to do a libation, close out.